It started a decade ago with the breakout indie film Clerks. Five films later, Silent Bob shows he still has an independent voice. Hi, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with writer, director, and actor Kevin Smith. Should all films have a message? No. Why not? What's <laughs> um, the point of having them? Uh, I don't know. I remember the, one of the reasons I got into filmmaking, uh, maybe not so much filmmaking, but one of the reasons I wrote Clerks, I was dating a girl at the time who was in college, and she was a literary criticism major. And uh, she was maintaining that all films could be criticized because all films had meaning, all writing had meaning, all art had meaning. I said, no, man, some just, you know, people do and say nothing that has no, empty you know sometimes things are just entertaining and that's it and uh, she uh, she was denying it and I said well, I'm, I'll show you I'll write something that has absolutely no meaning and can't really be broken down or criticized and I wrote Clerks and it, it, you know lo and behold it wound up having meaning and, and <laughs> being able to be criticized as well but uh, that was a movie that I really set out to you know have to mean very little to have no plot to have no Nothing to be broken down, just a series of vignettes. But does it tell something? Does it? I guess it tells something to the audience, right? They kind of yeah. dictate the meaning that it has. Um, I, I'm, sh you know, I'm sure, and, and I have as a filmmaker, have made films that you know definitely set out to say something. But sometimes the, the flicks you make wind up saying something that you had no intention of, and, and the audience finds it themselves. Is know? that frustrating as a writer? No, not at all. It's fine. Really? It's, it's, yeah, it's quite nice when people can find stuff in your material that you weren't necessarily in, intending to put there or thinking about putting there or plotting in advance, you know, because I, I, it kind of opens up your work to even to even you as, as the, the guy that kind of creates the work in Do the first place. you play the other game and say, yes, that's how I intended it? Sure, on Clerks, <laughs> people were, uh, you know, there were a lot of reviews that were like, you know, it's shot in stark black and white as if, you know, the uh, director clearly intended it to be the um, security camera's point of view. And when I first read that, I was like, what? And then I started being like, in the following interviews, you know, we shot it in black and white because <laughs> the intention was to have it seem like the whole movie was being shot from the security camera's point of view. So it can be helpful. Yeah. Uh, this will seem like kind of a strange question because mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard did you ever have any idea Clerks would endure the way it did? No, no. And uh, I mean, t you know, you got to remember, it was a movie that I kind of made for myself and my friends. Right. Um, and we never really thought it would play outside of Monmouth County, which is where we uh, grew up in Jersey. Um, so when it got picked up for the Sundance Film Festival, uh, you, you know, we were surprised that there were people in what we assumed was Utah, because that's where the festival was, who understood it, you know, who got the jokes. I thought it was really very Jersey centric. I thought it was really Monmouth County centric. I didn't even think people in Bergen County, which is kind of North Jersey, an hour away from us would necessarily get into it. So um, when we went to the festival, you know, you play in front of an audience that's more or less international. It's not just like people from around the country, it's people from around the globe. And uh, to hear people laughing at the same stuff that, that you know, we laughed at, my friends laughed at, I laughed at, was kind of eye-opening, you know. Yeah. It's just like, oh my God, so essentially this kind of stuff plays everywhere. The same, we can all identify with it, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it doesn't, there were no boundaries, it kind of traveled, humor travels, or not just humor, but people could identify with the people in the flick, people could identify with Dante and Randall to some degree. So, uh, I don't, it's, it was a real uh, education and communication in terms of like, it is a communication medium, it's not really just solely there to entertain or, or, or make you feel, it's, it's also kind of hurling out, you know, this, message into the void and and seeing if anyone responds and goes, yeah, yo, I understand. Right. And on, on the tale of everything you just said, why do you think, though, clerks worked? Um, at that time, we just kind of said the right thing at the right time, you know. I mean, uh, right or, maybe six months prior to that, people started talking about Generation X, the Douglas Copeland uh, notion that there is a generation of, of people who are slackers, for lack of a better description. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I guess we kind of were the first movie to encapsulate that, you know, not intentionally. So 
but it just wound up being like, oh, look, like these guys are, per this is Generation X personified. So, so I always felt like if we had done the movie one year earlier or one year later, nothing would have happened. You know, yeah. it was kind of luck and timing that we just kind of said the right thing at the right time. So that bought us um, space, in, you know, that year particularly. Why it still works ten years later, I have no idea. You know, I'm so glad that it doesn't occur to people as this little relic from the early 90s, you right. know, when grunge was huge or whatnot. I still get people who are coming up, you know, college kids and, and, and people, uh, high school kids, who are seeing it for the first time recently, and it still kind of works for them. It still holds up. It's not people going like, that's kind of a dated film. It's, it's kind of aged nicely, more or less. On a personal level, what does that say to you about the work? Um, it really taught me an important lesson in terms of that's what matters to me now, longevity, the longevity of the work. It's not about, like, opening box office. It's not about how well you do theatrically. To me, it's like, will the movie hold up in 10 years? Can the movie hold up in 20 years? Um, because the, the the box office is just one part of the equation, right? And, you know, and a lot of emphasis is put on it, and, and not just by the studio, but in our culture as well. You turn on the, the TV on Monday morning, and they give you the top 10 box office figures, or at least the top five. Um, it's come in, it become a horse race of sorts, and, you know, films... The quality of films are, are judged rather shorthandedly on how well they do at the box office and declared winners or losers. When in reality, that's that's not that's real short-term thinking. It's more mm -hmm. about does the movie kind of impact and stay with the viewer, and will it stay with them ten years from then? And if somebody watches it ten years from then, can it still work then? Or yeah. do, you know, does it seem like it kind of? little timepiece, you know, or, or if a, from a time capsule of that period, the, the period you made it. So to me, it's become much more important to make flicks that stand the test of time, you know, and I, I was never, a, you know, a numbers chaser in terms of, like, the box office. That stuff was never that important to me. But, you know, there's a lot of emphasis put on it. Um, and, you know, thankfully, we've always kept our budgets really moderate or low, so it's never affected us. It's never been like, you know, we got to go out there and make... 30 million bucks open a weekend or else right. we're ruined. But at the same time, th there was a kind of emphasis that was put on box office, and you do kind of get caught up in the horse race mentality. But now I just don't really care. Now it's just like, whatever it does, it does. But really to me, it's like, does the movie work? You know, And is it impacting? Does it affect people? Does it kind of touch them on an a emotional level or, you know, or a psychological level? Um, and then... Uh, how will it be received years from then? Is it still going to work? You know, are people still going to be able to kind of kick back, watch it, and feel good about it? Will they still respond to it? You know, when it's seen well outside the the period during which it was made. That's kind of that's ultimately the most important thing. Is that something you think about while you're crafting it, while you're writing? Um, no, because I hadn't started thinking about that. Well, you know, in the case of Jersey Girl, I hadn't started thinking about it because the Clerks thing hadn't really occurred to me. When I started writing Jersey Girl, we hadn't quite hit the 10-year mark on Clerks yet. We were, I guess, about uh, four years out or something, because I started writing Jersey Girl in 2000 while I was working on the Clerks cartoon. I wrote the first 50 pages in about two hours kind of as a counterbalance exercise because I spent so much time all day long gag writing for the, for the cartoon. I just right. wanted to write something with some depth. So I started writing it <clears throat> long before the 10th anniversary and before, you know, suddenly that was kind of put into perspective. Uh, and then we shot the movie two years later, and, and, the, and even then it's, it's still... I hadn't really been thinking about the, that whole 10-year mark, the, the watershed mark of sorts. And then as, as we had headed into the 10th year, you know, anniversary of Clerks, suddenly that, that became um, something I thought about quite a bit. So I haven't really written a movie uh, in that mindset yet. Next yeah. one, probably, though. Do you think knowledge can damage the gift? I mean, if you, if you start analyzing why things work, mm -hmm. could that change the way you approach things and end up altering the gift? Sure. I mean, well, that's the problem with the movie industry, right? It's like everybody kind of uh, overanalyzes and tries to put together, you know, a dish that uh, everyone's going to love, you right. know? So instead of getting a very unique dish that maybe isn't, you know, the, the favorite to everyone's palate or every palate's favorite, you wind up with a very bland dish that everybody can digest, but, you know, nothing really that special about it at the end of the day. So uh, I, I tend not to kind of overthink the whole thing, you know. I, I, I also kind of don't go in for the whole, let's make it 
as mainstream as possible. You know, when I handed Scott Mosier, my longtime producer, the script for Clerks, um, uh, not for Clerks, for Jersey Girl, he said, uh, it's weird, this is the most accessible movie that you've ever made. And I hadn't thought about it like that. Yeah. I was like, well, really? Why do you say that? And he's like, well, you know, you're dealing with themes that, like, aren't real niche this time around. It's like, you know, it's not about disenfranchisement, you know, of, of, the, of the convenience store and video store employees, or it's not about Catholicism, or it's not about male sexual insecurity, you know, or it's not about Jay and Silent Bob. You're, you're talking about being a father, being a parent, you know, being married. Those are kind of universal themes. And so that's weird because I hadn't thought about it like that. You know, I thought of it as a kind of very Nietzsche-oriented story, but apparently it wasn't the case. So I, I tend not to think in the broad. You know, I just kind of, I, I, I continue to write and make movies the same way I did the first time around, which was like write something that I want to see that I feel like I haven't seen on the screen before. You know, right. which is weird because I look at Jersey Girl and it's like, well, there have been a lot of movies about people being parents and stuff like that, but I haven't done one. You know, it's missing the particular spin that, that we were putting on this movie. And, um, you know, I accepted a long time ago that I'm not a very creative person. You know, I, I, it's not like I reinvent the wheel ever. You know, I look at some filmmakers like the Wachowski brothers. Well, I went to see the first Matrix, not the two horrible ones after that. The, uh, it, it was mind-bending, right? Never right. seen anything like it. Just like, this is, these guys are incredibly original. Like, I, wow, well, who knew? Who knew somebody could create something like this? And I'm not that guy. I'm not the guy that will ever create something that people go like, whoa, this is mind-bending. Never seen anything like it. I can't reinvent the wheel. But I can add a strong spoke to an already existing wheel, you know, and that's that to me is kind of the, the spin I kind of have on, 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 on making movies that aren't necessarily groundbreaking, you mm -hmm. know, like movies that are kind of just my particular take on, on, on a genre or on a, on a very off-told tale. Chasing Amy is just a boy meets girl story. It's just, it's the spin on it that's a little different. Jersey Girl is, is a, a family story, a family movie, parenthood story, my particular spin on it. Yeah. If people look at all of your films and mm -hmm. they sat down and watched them all one right after another, mm -hmm. what would they learn about you as a person that they might not know going into a viewing? Uh, they, they'd know that I obviously don't know where to put a camera when I make a film. <laughs> you know, that'd be good. I think if you had to watch my movies back to back to back, that's the overwhelming impression you'd have. That, and I'm apparently pretty chatty. Um, <laughs> however, if you watch it back to back, it would be like, oh, you could chart growth, right? You could chart growth in terms of like the movies start looking better. And then by the last one, you know, it looks really great. Uh, you can also see me kind of rein the dialogue in a bit more. The first few movies you look at, it's like, obviously, this dude's in love with language and in love with, you know, his, uh, his, uh, voca his own vocabulary. And then um, as we get toward the second half of the run, it's, it's, um, I kind of rein it in a bit and let the visuals tell the story more, mm -hmm. which is something I didn't always do at the, at the outset. People will say the critics out there are saying, and I mean by viewer critics, not mm -hmm. critic critics. You're a sellout now. You've gone mm -hmm. studio system. Mm -hmm. And from reading all the stuff that I've read about you, I know that you mm -hmm. don't agree with that. Yeah. But how does well, it make I mean, you yes feel? Well, I mean, yes and no. Yes that? and no. Like I do agree with them. I just don't agree with their, with the intent of the statement. I agree. I, I have gone the studio route because, but I did. That's that. not selling out. Necessarily. No, but I also did that on like way back at the beginning. You know, I've only ever really made one independent film, right. and that was Clerks. Um, every movie after that was financed by somebody else, and every movie after that was made under the, the aegis of a studio system, right? Like, Mallrats was made at Universal, Chasing Amy Forward was made at Miramax. Miramax is part of Disney. That is a studio. You know, right. everyone keeps pretending the elephant's not in the room, but Miramax is a studio. <laughs> There's just no two ways about it. So for people who are like, you've sold out and made a studio film, I'm like, I, hey, look, that happened a long time ago. You only noticed now. But to me, sellout is a person who kind of makes a film that they don't want to make, you know, to just pay the bills or to kind of get to a place in their career, you know, where, where they've got some massive solid hit under their belt or something like that. Um, hack work, you know. Right. And to me, I, I've never made, I've never done that, never once done that. Never made a movie I didn't want to make. Always, have only always ever made films that were very personal to me and stuff that I've generated. Um, Selling out to me would be directing a script I didn't write, for example. Um, and I've never done that. Everything I've written. I'm, you know, I'm doing uh, Green Hornet next, right, right, for Miramax, and that's a big, expensive comic book movie. Um, even that's not a sellout to me. Like, I, I, I've been a comic book fan my whole life. I've written comic books. wrote Daredevil for DC, for Marvel, and wrote Green Arrow for DC. Um, 
you know, worked on the Superman movie at one point a few years back. Um, have, I'm always out there talking about comics. Chasing Amy is about comic book creators. Dogma is a kind of one big graphic novel. Like, for, for, for that guy to make a comic book movie, that's about the least sellout move I could think of. That's a logical <laughs> progression right yeah. there. You could actually see that coming miles away. So, um, so for the people that are just like, you sold out, you sold out, you know, it's just like, whatever. I mean, as soon as you guys are out of high school, you realize that, no, I didn't really sell out. And I'll tell you when I've sold out, or I'll cop to it, you know. Yeah. Or it'll be much easier to kind of pin it on me. You know, the moment I direct somebody else's script, I've sold out. Really? For sure. Absolutely. Because I'm not, I'm not a very gifted visual storyteller, you know. I'm not, I don't really think of myself as a director. I'm kind of a writer who gets to direct his own stuff. Right. Um, and I'm real comfortable with that. You know, if somebody put a gun to my head and said, you know, pick one, what are you? I'm a writer, hands down. Um, I've just been lucky enough to actually direct the stuff that I've written. So the, um, the notion of me directing somebody else's script is a real foreign one because I, I couldn't really bring, um, you know, visual skills to bear or, 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 or kind of like I know how to interpret this work I don't I only really know how to interpret my own stuff and even sometimes there I don't you know sometimes I'm just kind of winging it visually but the only time I ever came close to directing somebody else's script was on Good Will Hunting when we brought it into Miramax and they said do you want to you want to direct it and you know I thought about it for a moment because I love the script so much and then I was just like you know what I'd ruin it don't give it to me like I love the script so much find a director who can translate this material and you know, kind of honor it and make it their own at the same time. But uh, me, I'd be deferring the whole time, right? Because I believe in the writer more mm-hmm. more than anything else. So I would be turning to Ben and Matt and be like, "All right, so do, is this how you guys saw the shot when you wrote it? Like, should I change it? What, what would be the point? You know, you need somebody in the driver's seat who's just like, I got a vision. I, I you know, I can see this movie in my head, and I'm gonna, you know, bring it to fruition and stuff. And I really didn't have that. Does the key to your success lie in what you just said, in that realizing? where your strengths are, capitalizing on those, as opposed to people who, as they get more successful, grab more power and water themselves down, do you think? I don't know, because the flip side of it is, is saying, like, is the key to your success the fact that you're limited? And <laughs> I mean, maybe it is, right? <laughs> maybe it is to some degree. And knowing those limitations is kind of important. Um, I think I've always kind of fancied the fact that I've never really bitten off more than I could chew. And, you know, some people will kind of, you're screwed either way, right? You'll always get criticized no matter what. There'll be people who'd be like, "Well, he show, he doesn't show any any interest in growth," and it's just like, "Well, okay." <laughs> and if I try growth, all right, look, look, here's a movie where I try growth, Jersey Girl, and then you've got some people going like, "Oh, what is he doing? He shouldn't be making movies like this. You know, he should be making thought provoking <laughs> yeah. movies about you know guys falling in love with lesbians and, and Catholic Church and blah blah blah." So you know, you get kind of screwed either way. But um, I I don't know. I I don't know that we've necessarily been. Uh, successful. I know we've had longevity, ten years in this business. You know, particularly in a time when we popped up in the in the right in the smack dab in the middle of the indie movement, the the renaissance of the indie, indie movement. Because you know, you got to give credit to Cassavetes and the guys who did it years and years before right. you. But in that you know that early '90s post uh, Jarmuschian, you know, link later Rodriguez uh, indie movement. Not a lot of us really hung out or stuck around, you know. Go back and look at the catalogs for clerks from 90 to 95 and see how many of those guys are, are working anymore. See how many of those 16, 14, 16 films that were chosen every, chosen every year uh, have a director who's still actually out there working. So longevity I can cop to because we're still around. Success? I don't know. That, that really, I mean, that's something that gets, I, for me, that kind of gets measured, you know, in the grave. I'll never know how successful we've ever been until I'm dead, buried, and like, you know, if they're still talking about our stuff years from then, then I guess we kind of succeeded. We talk about longevity then. Mm-hmm. Why have you lasted? Why did all or so many of those other ones not make it to this point? What was it that got you here? I work cheap, you know. I think that's a big, a big part of it. Um, we've always kind of kept our budgets fairly low, so nobody's ever really lost money on us. Um, even Universal, which were, you know, a few years ago, I'd have been like, "Oh, we lost them six million dollars when we made Mallrats because we only made two and change at the box office." I have long since recouped, you know, because that yeah. movie became a big um, cult hit on on video. So um, all the stuff we've done for Miramax is earned, you know, and and um, if it's borderline, if it earned borderline at the box office, our video killed. We've always been really popular on video as well. 
So uh, all of our stuff has made some, earned back their budgets and made somebody a little scratch. And we had the good fortune of, you know, uh, backing people that became really big or backing projects that became big, like, like Goodwill Hunting. So I, I think it's the, I think it largely has to, because it's a business, right? Show business. And um, a lot of people can make films and then they don't really get seen or don't get like national or international distribution. But the, um, the fact that we have uh, it really comes down to the fact that we've been able to earn because it is a business and people want to make their money back and see some scratch on top of it. So we've always been able to do that. I know that's why we continue to work at Miramax. You know, there's also a degree of family um, there, you know, because we came in early on and, and part of that, you know, Quentin and, and Robert uh, Miramax family thing, which works in our favor as well. But, you know, I. I think Harvey and Bob might forget that we were family pretty quickly if we were constantly losing money for them. Yeah. Um, so I think I think the fact that we've kept our budget slow and people have been able to earn off of our backs really points to our longevity. Um, and the reason those movies earn is because I guess we keep saying stuff that people identify with to some degree or another. That's the beautiful thing to me. It's like I love making the movies, but I really love actually going out there to call it college Q&A's and comic book show Q&A's and whatnot and hanging out on the internet on our website on the web board the message board and talking to the people who keep you in business the people that you know buy the tickets the people who identify with your, with your stuff uh, mostly every time you, you do something uh, because uh, you remember oh yeah that's, what, that's kind of what I do right I yeah. throw that message out there so you who's, who's kind of digging on it to see who kind of identifies with it and communication medium so for me like to I, that's the part I love the most because it's the instant feedback, you know, from the from the See, audience. See, that, that one thing I was going to ask you is success separates you from your viewers. It's not for you know, me. And yet you, yeah, you no, can't it married you. me to my to my viewers. They're not really. I mean, I don't even think of them as viewers, really. You know, I just think of them as the they're part of the machine. You know, like there's this big machine. I'm a big cog in it, and those guys are a big cog in it too because without them, the machine doesn't quite work, and then you know I get replaced by somebody else. <laughs> Um, so to me, they're just as important as Harvey and Bob or Affleck or you know anyone else involved in the process of pulling the films we've made together. Um, yeah, those guys. I, I live and die by the by the by the folks who who kind of support us, the po folks who go see our movies. Yeah. Um, you know, I get tons of feedback from them. Um, I try not to shape the material based on the stuff they say because ultimately that's a disservice to them, right? Because they're going because they like what I'm saying. And I don't want them to go because I'm saying what they want me to say. You know, I want them to go because they identify with what I'm saying. But it's great to have that feedback, nonetheless, to know what they what they kind of like, what they don't like. And also, to me, it's just like being inside gives you a great opportunity to pull back the curtain and be like, "This is what it is. It's really not that mystical." You know, come on in, check it out. So I've always I would have appreciated that when I was younger, somebody who would actually kind of show me behind the scenes or you know something like that so I'm kind of into that and and really demystifying the process like look it's a chimp could do this you know right. as long as the chimp had the right script or the chimp had something clever to say so I always tend to bring cats in and and show them what it's like and as I understand it too your your strong belief strong script that's where it starts yeah totally totally yeah I think so I mean Clerks is a a, a really good uh, example of that you know because Clerks is a movie that looks terrible looks like it was shot through a glass of milk you know, and there's no disservice to, or, or slam on Dave Klein, the DP. It's just we didn't know what we were doing. You know, we were at rank amateurs at that point, and we didn't have a lot of money, so it looks terrible. Some of the performances are insanely wooden. You know, you're not you're not talking about a great crew of actors there. Thankfully, our leads were great. You know, Brian and Jeff really kind of carried the material, but like throughout the rest of the film, some of those performances are pretty bad. It's what was being said. People kind of dug on. You know, they, they kind of the laughs and, and and the the dialogue stuff like that carried us. You know, we were able to kind of rise above all of our flaws and all the um, all the stuff that you know most other movies would kind of get put down for. And and you know, our our, our kind of um, flaws became our merits at a certain point. You know, going back to the whole like looks like it was shot from the security camera point of view. It's it, it totally worked in our benefit, you know, that we looked as bad as we did, but it was what was being said that people kind of dug on. So from an early 
point forward for me it was always like well it's the script everything else can sag a little as long as the script is tight right I'd read somewhere that you weren't quite sure what direction you're going to go now mm -hmm. still in that same place I mean well I know I'm, what I'm doing next immediately I know what I'm doing for the next two at least I know we're going to do the Green Hornet and I know we're going to do um, an adaptation of uh, the Gregory McDonald book Fletch One W-O-N uh, after that I'm not quite sure there's a part of me that you know I told Jason Mewes if you can get and stay clean you know, I think about going back into Jay and Bob world because, uh, you know, Muse was real knee-deep in the heroin and Oxycontins for a while. But he's April 6th, he's one year clean. And okay. uh, he's doing really, really well. No drinking, nothing. Really, really well. So um, there's a part of me that would like to do that, would like to, you know, put on the trench coat again and, <laughs> and play because, I mean, of all the stuff we've done, it may not have the most depth to it or the most substance, but Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back was the most fun we ever had making a movie, hands right. down. And sometimes you need to throw one of those in for yourself that's just kind of like uh, one that like uh, is all about the enjoyment the sheer enjoyment the sheer fun of, of making a movie and well, not just I've got kind of story thank you for sharing these stories with us right now once again we're out of time oh we, 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 it happens no we're great killed the clock today. <laughs> Kevin Smith thank you thank you yeah.